Hello? Ooh, there I am. Yes. So, for those of you who don't know, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm uh, actually studying to become a pastor. And so, on the back of the bulletin, it says intern. That's, that's me. That means I'm a student and I don't know what I'm doing. So, give me, give me grace. Um, <laughs> but I think most of us sometimes feel like that. Um, when I went through school, I was taught to, to, to manuscript and, and then to, to read my sermons and everything like that, and my mentors have been telling me, eh, that doesn't really work very well these, these days. So you get to be my guinea pigs today. Woohoo! So typically, I write it all out, and I have it in 18-point you know, font, so you can probably read it way back there. But um, I wrote out my sermon, and it was six. 18 and a half pages long at, at 18 point font and so I got it down to four pages of, of notes so hopefully that will work um, but be patient with me I've done this once in the past and after I did it they said eh, maybe go back to the manuscript so <laughs> let's let's hope for for the best uh, we're going to be reading and studying uh, Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 20 and Way, okay, that better, okay. And um, the reason that I chose this scripture is it's kind of out of no nowhere. If you kind of look at how we've been doing, we've been going through Romans, we've been doing other things, but this scripture actually kind of sp speaks to me because. 21 years ago, we had a little thing happen called 9/11, and. Um, Sometimes when you read through scripture, you see things that happen in your life. And it's not necessarily that God is uh, prophesying that specific task, but it shows it in, in your life. So sometimes scripture reminds us of things in our lives. Do you guys have anything like that? You know, some of them in mine is, you know, finding your first love. So Song of Sol Solomon, how beautiful are you? you how beautiful you are, my darling, how beautiful your eyes are doves. I chose not to do the one with the, with the doe and, and the horse and stuff. Cause, yeah. uh, how, how about when we got married? My wife and I used 1 Corinthians 13 as our verse during our, our wedding. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love is, does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always per perseveres. So you can remember that. Our, the birth of our child, our first child. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Or when we go on a mission trip, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. Even sadly, at the death of a loved one, Jesus comforts us. I am the resurrection and the life, and, no, and the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So scripture isn't written so that it will tell us about our lives, as in it's going to um, say, when you read through, you go, oh, this is what's going to happen in, in, in my life. But it is good to see yourself in Scripture, because that helps you to remember it. There's been many times when I've had things going on in my life that, that were stressful, and a Scripture would just pop up. And so having Scripture in your, in your brain is a useful tool. It's not called the sword for nothing. Yeah. So the scripture we're covering today is try that. So the scripture we're covering today is tied to an event that uh, looks like everybody in this room was alive during. Again, it's not because John was prophesying that this was specifically going to happen, but we do see this event mirrored in scripture. So I'll read. Chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. 
when they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, this, was there ever a city like this, great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping they will mourn out and mourning they will cry out. Woe, woe, O great city, there where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. So what event is this, can you guys think? That might be pointing towards? No, it'd be 9-11. So there's a, there was an Alan Jackson song that came out right afterwards, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning on that September Day? So I remember that I was a sophomore in, in, in college, and being such, I like to sleep in. And so my mom woke me up at the god-awful early morning hours of 6 a.m. I don't know how people did that. But, and she said, uh, we've, been a, we've been attacked. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know what you're talking about. So I remember getting up and, and watching the, uh, the uh, news and seeing the smoke from the towers. And, um, and then I was watching when they, when they collapsed and everything. And it was amazing how time just stopped. And I was a lifeguard at the time, so I remember I went to, to, uh, the, to the pool to teach swim lessons and things, and nobody showed up. So I just sat at the pool, and it's right over there, um, and so the airport's right over here, so it was really strange not seeing airplanes fly over. And as the weeks went on, people found this scripture, and they pointed to it, and they said, look, see... John was prophesying about the fall of, a, of America, you know, get ready, Jesus is coming tomorrow, or, you know, in the next couple of days. Well, here we are 21 years later, so they were wrong. So what is this scripture really about? Before we dive in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word, that you've preserved it for us, and that you tell us what we need to know through it. Thank you that we live in a country where we can study your word without fear. And I thank you that you comfort us in all that we do. Please help us today as we study that we are able to see what your word truly says and that we're able to um, take heart and to put into practice what you would have us do in our lives. Please be with everyone here. Speak to them and show them the truth of your word. And be with me, help me to only say what you would have me say. In your most holy name we pray, amen. So, one of the things you learn about when you go to school to be a, a pastor is this thing called hermeneutics. If, I know it's a really big, funky word. There's actually a, a program out there called Herman Who about, about hermeneutics. And it's the theory and the methodology of, interpre of interpretation, especially related to biblical text wisdom literature, and philosophical text. Hermeneutics is actually an art form of understanding communication, and it has three main rules. Context, context, and context. So you want to look at, when you're looking at scripture, you want to look at the context in the full chapter, the context in the full book, then the context in the whole scripture. So when we focus in on just one little scripture, we can make it say whatever we want it to say. And that's what those people were doing. So if we step back into the chapter, we can see that the fall of a great city, um, that there was an escape from the destruction by God's people, and that there was a lament of people who were entangled in the, in the well-being, or in the doings of the city. If we step back another level, we see the book. The book of Revelation is a, prof, is a prophetic and a... I always say this word wrong apocalyptic writing, and John was writing it when he was exiled on the island of Patmos. This book is largely written in code. Uh, he's foretelling the future fall of the Roman Empire, but because of the brutal nature of the emperors, he could not write plainly to his readers because you know, the Roman emperors weren't so, so kind. It is important to remember that John is not writing to us with the intention that we should read Revelation with our Bibles in one hand and the newspaper in the other. We need to read it as the original audience would have read it and understood it. So if we step back one more time, we can look at it in relation to all of Scripture. 
If we focus on the Old Testament, because that's what they had back then, we'll, we'll see that um, chapters 17 and 18 are actually a large poem, and they parallel the writings of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel when they speak about the fall of Babylon. They all prophesied the fall of Babylon, which was actually Babylon at the time they wrote it, but they also pointed to a future kingdom that would be crushed by Christ. In John's immediate context, he's talking about the Roman Empire. Church history also implies that the foretold Antichrist would be the Holy Roman Empire, or the papacy. Now, with the proper context, let's look more in depth at the verses. So chapter 18, verse 1. After this, you have to think, after what? Remember, 17 and 18 are one large poem. In chapter 17, John spoke about um, the, the prostitute who sat on the beast that was causing havoc to the church. So he saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. So when you read through Revelation, you'll see that there's two directions that happen. There's things coming down from earth, and there's things com- or coming up from earth, and there's things coming down from heaven. They both have a boomerang effect. Things that come from earth are coming to grab you and drag you back down, and things that come from heaven are coming to grab you and bring you to the Father. But who is this angel that we're talking about? Again, it says, he had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. This angel had the authority of God. His will was aligned with the will of God, and all the earth was made right by his words. Let's see if I can say this name right. Prometheus, he was a 6th century commentator on the book of Revelation. He had the really good Sunday school uh, answer that this was Jesus, and I would agree with with him. Chapters 2 and 3. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great! She has become a home for demons, and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean, detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So the angel proclaims the fall of this great city the great city of Babylon. But if you know anything about geographical history, you know that Babylon didn't exist at the time that John wrote this. And that goes to show the the point that John was writing in, in code. Early church fathers wrote that Babylon stood for Rome. We can see this when Paul writes in his first epistle to the church, um, in, in Rome, he says, She who is in Babylon sent you her greetings. We also read that Babylon is a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean, detestable bird. So that is something that that's where so, something lives. Birds are typically not seen as good, and unclean spirits obviously are not good. Um, in Babylon, or Rome, we know it had lots of idolatry. And that's what people were doing. That's kind of what human nature is. You're, you're made to worship something, and if you're not going to worship God, you'll find something else to worship. And as it go, goes on, it says, For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. Rome had idolatry. And if you look throughout the Bible, any time sexual immorality or do, idolatry is mentioned, It's associated with idolatry. We can think of uh, Hosea, the the prophet, who his his wife was a a prostitute, and um, that showed how um, Israel was treating God. So, chapter four, or not, verse four. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, "Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues." So coming out is an important tradition. 
and we're not talking about how the world says about com coming out, but that as a people chosen by God, we're called to come out of the world. Perhaps you've seen the stickers. Uh, is it N O N T O W? Not of N O T W. Not of of the world. So we're we're in this world, but we're not supposed to be part of of, of the world. We're supposed to be called out. Um, Another, another way to think about it is, is holy, something that's separated. These shoes, for example, are my church shoes. So they're, I only wear them when I go to church. So that's why they're kind of nice looking as opposed to my mud boots, uh, which I know some of you have seen those, me wearing those around here on accident. But um, they're, they're set aside for a specific purpose. And throughout Scripture, we see that God calls people out of situations. We see that he called Noah out of the world through a flood, that Abraham was called out of his country, Lot's family was called out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses and the Israelites were called out of Egypt, Rahab was called out of Jericho, uh, we have Israel and Judah being called into slavery, or not slavery, but captivity, and that Judah was called back from Babylon. There's many, many more. And Paul asks us in 2 Corinthians 6, what do clean and unclean have in common? Something that I like to think about is when I used to go to my, my grandma's house. Uh, being a little kid, I was dirty all the time, and she wouldn't let me sit on the furniture because I was dirty. You know, so I think I've shared this in the past, but I, I raised pigs, and even when, even when we had our, our little pet pig and he was, he was clean, uh, we wouldn't let him come in and sit on the furniture because no matter how clean we tried to make him, he was always dirty. So in the, in the same way, we not that we're, we're perfect in ourselves, but that we're set apart for, for God, we shouldn't be taking ourselves and putting ourselves in these situations. So verses 5 and 6. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is given. Pay her back double for what she has done. So verses 5 and 6 tell us that this, why the city has earned the ire of God. This is the same woman from chapter 17 that I mentioned, who sat on the beast and she drank the blood of the saints. For a little more clarification, chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came to me and said to me, Come, I will show you the great punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, and had seven heads on ten, and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This was the title written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. I saw that this woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. So we can see that this is, is not a good person. Chapters are verses seven and eight continue on. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury that she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death and mourning and famine, she will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So she boasts that she will not be brought to shame. There's a, a old reformer, his name was uh, Johann Gerhardt, and he compared this to the papacy, and he paraphrased this, this verse saying, I sit in the seat of Peter. I am the vicar of Christ and the successor of Peter. I hold the highest authority in the whole church. 
in the political realm, I reign over kings and princes. I have not failed until now, nor shall I ever fail to be a successor to the apostolic seat of Peter. I shall always prevail over my enemies. Victory and happiness will ever be at my side. So this is kind of a warning against pride. If you've heard me speak in, in the past, you know that uh, pride is at the root of all sins. That you steal something because you believe that you, you deserve it. Or you, yeah, thanks, Sean. No, you're good. And, uh, or you uh, commit adultery because you don't think that your, your wife is worth your time anymore. Or you lie because you want to make yourself look better. But pride also is warned about in the Old Testament. In Proverbs 6.18 and, and Psalms 10, we're told that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So because of the pride of this woman, she'll have a sudden judgment, unanticipated in its suddenness, just like Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, that it will come like a thief in the night. And Paul was just echoing the words of Jesus when he said in Luke 14 about his coming, being like a thief in the night. Verse 9, verse nine. When the kings of the earth committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. So again, we see a picture in our own lives of 9-11 that... Um, the, the world's leaders were looking and they saw the destruction that, that we had. And they were weeping and they were mourning. But in this situation, they weren't weeping and mourning because they were sad about what happened or they weren't worried about um, you know, the actual people like people were. They were worried because the fall of the city was the fall of their, of their economic success. At 9-11, we were struck with our symbols of our economic and military powers when they hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And the wailing, like I said, was not because of their sinful behavior where they saw that something was being punished and that they were filled with, with compassion and that they were filled with, with grief and remorse that they had sinned. No, they were crying because they lost their seat on the gravy train. So in verse 10 we read, Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe! Woe, O great city! O Babylon, city of power! In one hour your doom has come. So we can remember that these were the, the, the kings who helped the adulterous woman in chapter 17. The great city was powerless in God's judgment. And we should not tremble before governments, but before our just and holy God. How many times when we go through our life do we fear, oh no, what is the government going to do? Or, oh, what if this country is going to, to invade? Here was a great, huge city that everybody loved, everybody was getting rich from, who had so much power, but had no power against God. Verse 11. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one will buy their cargo anymore. Here we see that the merchants were actually worshipers of, of money. You know, so like I mentioned before, they weren't worried that the city had fallen. They weren't worried about the people in the city. They were worried about their riches. Verses 12 and 13 list off all the cargoes that, that they sold. We'll read them real quick. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet cloth, and every sort of citron wood, and the articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men. 
So you may be thinking, why in the world would you just read through, through that? That's kind of boring. You know, sometimes when you read through all the genealogies and you're like, oh, this is just so hard to listen to. But when you read through that, you can think, well, maybe the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus would love to shop here. You know, and it sounds a lot like all of the wonderful wealth that they had in the times of Solomon, where they said that uh, silver was worth nothing because of how rich they were. These people were not the dollar store owners. They weren't the, the people who were providing everybody's day-to-day -day needs. They were the, the Neiman Marcus or the Gucci. They were out there um, catering to, to the rich. And we see that the last thing that they, that they listed was slaves or human souls. And that makes you think, this has been going on since there have been people. What will people not trade if they think that they can make a profit? Even back uh, in the history in, in the Bible, we have Joseph being sold into slavery. And human trafficking still comes today as being a horrible sin. You know, yes, we may have gotten rid of slavery in, in America, but it's still alive in different ways. Verse 14. They say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendors have vanished, never to be recovered. So we see here that the world is passing away. First Corinthians says that those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them, for this world, as we know it, will soon pass away. And John, in his first epistle, writes, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So, again, this is just saying the same thing over and over, but it's important. Repetition teaches us the best way. So we know that if we strive after things of this world, if we're trying to get the new car, get the bigger house, get whatever it is it takes to keep up with the Joneses, but we're neglecting God, we're neglecting what he's called us to, that that's not going to work out for our lives. He's called us to something greater. He's called us not to be um, big in this world because the world is passing away. Verses 15 through 17. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, the glittering and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their livings from the sea will stand far off. So again, I mentioned the rich man in Lazarus. But the rich man, we know that he wasn't able to take any of his wealth with him when he died. And so we should not focus on the stuff of, of the world. There's a bumper sticker or something out there that, that says, you know, he who la dies with the most toys wins or, you know, my goal is to rack up as much credit card debt as I can before I die, or, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. That's not how I am, but um, our goal, again, it shouldn't be that we're going to uh, rack up as many physical possessions, because I saw another, another meme, you know, I'm a millennial, so um, there was a, a picture of an old guy, sorry, uh, a well-seasoned citizen with his son, standing in, in front of a, uh, um, a storage unit that was open and just crammed full of, of stuff. And, and uh, it brought me back to the, to the Lion King when, when he says, and behold, all this will be yours one day, son. You know? <laughs> and we think that you know, all the stuff that we have in our lives, in our, in our home, all, all the clutter and stuff, you know, that used to be money. You know, that it's not important to be collecting all these things. It's important that we use that, that money to reach others for what we have that's lasting. And that's the, the word. That our job is not to be going out and making people go, oh, look at us, look how awesome we are. We're not supposed to focus on that kind of thing. We know that 
as Jesus said, my word will not pass away. So everything that, that we have is for Jesus. The only thing we have is because of Jesus. And if we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. In here, we've also heard many times about the suddenness. Oh, it happened in an hour. It, it, whoa, it just, just happened so quick. All who love the, the world will fear their, their ruin when it falls. Peter tells us that it will all burn, burn up. And the merchants on the ships, they, they remind me of, again, New York City being a great merchant city, a great port. Um, you have, I don't know if you guys know about transportation, but I was in logistics for a while. Ships will line up a couple miles off, off of shore and wait to go in and be, and be unloaded. And when I read this, this portion, it makes me think about all those people who were sitting on, on the ships. You know, maybe they saw the, the airplanes hit, or maybe they saw the smoke, maybe they saw it come up. And as somebody who has been in transportation, I know that as soon as that happened, they're stuck out in the water because they're not going to be allowed in. And so you have to think about the people that it's not just, oh, we're not going to be able to sell our, our, our well, our are wares, but they're going to be stuck out in the ocean with no communication, no no way to, to get in. Uh, so they had their own uh, worries to take care of. And I also re uh, remember that after the attacks, that there was a financial um, standstill as as well. Nobody went out and did did business. Um, there was no nothing going on. Verses 18 and 19. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning they will cry out, Whoa, whoa, a great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. So these sailors, just like the merchants and just like the kings, they were worshipers of money. And while, yes, there was um, true heart, hardship for, for them, the city was their idol. And they were shocked because they thought that the city could never fail, never fall. Um, I'm sure many in, in America thought when, when we were attacked, what? We haven't been, a, been attacked since Pearl Harbor. This couldn't happen. The fall of the city caused mourning, but the mourning again was not of repentance over sin. No, it was the mourning of the loss of their idol. The world has just changed for them, and the shock of his, and their shock is the rudeness of it all. So God's grace and judgment through times of trial is the title of this sermon. It, it kind of sounds, sounds bad, but it's actually good. Because God will judge those who don't follow him. But for those of us who do follow him, it's actually a blessing. We can think of the great uh, philosopher. Um, he used to wear a red sweater, and he put on sneakers, and he played with puppets. Mr. Rogers, if you don't, don't know. He says, when, when bad things happen... Look for the helpers. There were many good things that, that happened after 9-11. I remember I was, didn't have to go to school yet, so I planned a trip to go out and help uh, go through the, uh, the rubble. People were lining up to fill up the, the boots with the firefighters. People were giving blood. People were doing things that need to be done in a society. And sometimes it takes something like a 9-11 to shock everybody back into seeing that it's not just about what can we get, what can we get, but that we're all in this t together, that we need to have each other in order to survive. And then verse 20 comes. We have kind of a We've been having doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. And then all of a sudden, we get 
Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for you the way that she treated you. So we have a different voice coming out of nowhere. What causes grief and wailing for the things of this world actually cause rejoicing in heaven. For those of us who belong to, and for those of us who belong to heaven's kingdom, we're told in, in Matthew, seek first after the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. When the world is falling down around us, we have nothing to fear because we have not placed our hope in the things of this world. When the judgment of the world comes, for us, it is a cause of rejoicing and celebration. So I want to leave you with a hymn. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. If you've heard me sing, you, you'll, you'll know the, what a blessing that is. Uh, it was written by a, a German back in the 16th, or 1600s, so the 17th century. And I can't pronounce his name, so if you want to know it, I have it written down up, up here. It says, What is the world to me with all its vaunted pleasure when you and you alone, Lord Jesus, are my treasure? You only, dearest Lord, my soul's delight shall be. You are my peace, my rest. What is the world to me? What is the world to me, my Jesus, my treasure, my life, my health, my wealth, my friend, my love, my pleasure? My joy, my crown, my all, my bliss eternally. Once more then I declare, what is this world to me? We have nothing to lose when Jesus is all that we long for. What is, it, is this world to you? Do you cling tightly and worship the idols of this world? Or do you put your faith in Jesus Christ? I will close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the time that we were able to come and to get into your word. Thank you that you have inspired it and preserved it for us, that the words you wrote thousands of years ago are the words that we hold in our hands. Thank you that you've set us aside for something greater than material and worldly pleasure. Help us to seek your, your kingdom and not the riches of this world. Give us the faith and the courage to trust you that we know that you are our good shepherd, that we can trust you, and that as long as we seek after your kingdom, you'll give us all that we need. Lord, we thank you as we move on to our celebration of your supper. We thank you for the body that you took on, that you broke. We thank you that you came down from heaven, that you even took on a body Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed that washes us clean from our sins. We thank you for the wonderful sacrifice that you gave for us. Lord, and yes, we thank you for the death that, that you died, and we thank you for coming again and rising to show us that you truly are God. Lord, and we look forward to you coming again. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so now we have communion. In the Bible, communion is mentioned, not the word communion, but the, the practice of it is mentioned four times in the Bible. It's time for a little quiz. I'll give you the first three, and you guys can tell me what the fourth one is. It's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Where do you think the fourth one is? What'd you say? John. No, not John. Not Acts. What'd you say? Of course, yeah. Yeah, the, the pastor answered.